the world. Subscribe now to the Hot 97 YouTube channel. It's Ebro in the morning with Laura Styles and Rosenberg. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's Ebro, and it's Laura, and it's Rosenberg. And today we have Freeway Rick Ross on the program. We're going to be talking about the things he has going on now that he's been out of jail for the last, well, almost 11 years, right, sir? 13. 13. 13. 13 yeah, years. Yeah, you see that make me years. smile. You see that smile come on my face when you say 13. 13, mm. right? Uh, I, I also, uh, he's doing a doing a podcast. Um, if you're watching Snowfall, the 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 TV show Snowfall is loosely based on this man's real life. Um, what, the early parts. The early. The parts. early parts. Yes, the early parts. Um, I want to I want to start with uh this podcast that you're doing. Um, which is called After the Snow. How did this come about? Well, I, I was I was sitting at the house one day and uh, Dave Mays called me and he was like, hey, man, I know you don't watch the, snow, the show Snowfall, uh, but I think I got a way that uh, you can get some get back. And I was like, all right, I'm listening. <laughs> and he started talking about the show where I went into the story and, and I was able to break down the show uh, of true and falses and uh, things that I recognize uh, to be like me. And I thought about it and I was like, man, I don't want to watch that show, man. Um, I felt so slighted, you know, by uh, by John Singleton, you know. Um, that, well, well, that Quickly, if, quickly to interject, um, why did you feel slighted by John Singleton, who obviously is a kid from uh, the L.A. area and grew up um, did you feel like there should have been a conversation between you both before he passed about the show? Well, we had a conversation before he passed. I saw him about two months before he passed. Uh, he told me that he uh, he had a spot for me on the show and he also had some money for me, but uh, that neither one of those ever transpired. Um, but, you know, me and him were working on my movie script. Uh, mm. He bought he bought one of my demo books. And um, I later found out that on his page, if you, you you know, this was before I was going on Instagram or, or any of the social media sites. He had posted a picture of me and him holding the book saying, uh, Rick Ross, great story, snowfall coming soon. And and I wouldn't have known that because I didn't go online. But later on, I found out that uh, that he had posted that picture. Uh, so I, I thought me and him were friends. Well, he's not here. You know, it sucks that he's not here to um, tell his side of things. Um why now are you doing the podcast and do you wish that, you know, I don't know. It just feels odd that he's not here to even tell his side of things. It, it feels as if you, you you feel slighted by him. You feel it definitely feels like some bad energy, but is that what your intention is? Or you just want to tell your side of the story? Well, well no, no, I, th I think that, 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 that with after the snow is more or less uh, me and Dave, watching the show, analyzing it, and giving our perspective on the show. It's not to, to, to hurt the show or anything like that there. You know, if you if you ever watch After the Snow, we're not bad mouthing snow, snowfall, um, but we, we, are giving, we are giving our perspective on it. Now, um, quickly, uh, for the audience, um, if you have not heard of, done any research on this man that's with us today, Freeway Rick Ross, um, many people say that you are the individual that um, fast forwarded or started what became known as the crack era uh, in America. Is that true or false? Am I framing that right? I, I would I would say that that I played a major part. Uh, uh, when I first started, I was I was considered young for the game. I was 19 years old. Uh, the other guys that were involved were, was much older than I was. Uh, and I opened the door for a lot younger guys than me because the guys that I hung out with were mostly younger than I was. Uh, my crew was, was younger than me. So uh, I, I made I made crack look glamorous. Uh, uh, I made it fun. And, and in Snowfall, um, you know, and I think true to your story, if I remember your story correctly, you were playing high school tennis in correct. Compton, correct? Uh, Los Angeles. Compton in, in too. We, we played mostly Los Angeles, but I played in Compton too. And one of your tennis instructors actually introduced you to selling cocaine, correct? Mm. No, not a tennis instructor, but a, a friend that I played tennis with. He a was friend a friend that you played. Yeah, he was a teacher 
uh, uh, that I was taking a poster class with. And um, and it went from cocaine to crack. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Uh, uh, we, we didn't call it crack. We called it ready rock uh, because uh, when people used to come by in the mornings to, to get they to get their dose, uh, they wouldn't have their cooking utensils. And we started cooking it for them. And then we would call it already rock. It was already rock. And, you know, in the streets, they just started calling it ready rock. Wow. And, and who introduced you to that uh, chemistry? Uh, it was it was a few people doing it uh, when when I when I started, uh, but nobody would actually teach you how to do it. Uh, it was just being around the game uh, so long that I eventually picked it up. Um, and so there's a, another element in Snowfall, which is the way um, the journalist was trying to cover. It. There's a woman in Snowfall who ends up getting killed by the CIA agent. Hopefully, I'm not spoiling for anybody that hasn't watched it yet, but kind of helps us tell this story but in in real life a man named gary webb uh who worked for the san jose mercury news covered what was going on with crack the flow of cocaine and crack in the los angeles and the selling of drugs in america to finance a war going on uh with the um the contra rebels down in uh and manuel it was manuel noriega right no nicaragua or nicaragua excuse me um and and they frame this in snowfall that part is true correct yeah yeah that's true and did you know gary webb had you ever met him before they you know quote unquote found him and he committed suicide which nobody believes yes gary came to my cell and visited me several times um and so it's it's pretty much universally understood and and accepted as fact that our government helped you get cocaine make money cover for you to finance basically a war uh and and basically de destabilizing a government in central america well, well i think what the what the uh what we do know for a fact without a shadow of a doubt the cia admitted it that they turned a blind eye uh they knew that the contras were selling drugs bringing them to south central los angeles uh they did admit that in in their own cia report uh, but they didn't go as far as saying that uh, they helped uh, in any form or any fashion. Do you remember being young? I heard rumors, and I think Gary Webb wrote about this. When, I remember this. Do you remember the days when there used to be like, and, and tell me if I'm remembering this right or wrong, um, that literally trains would pull up in South Central L.A., full of guns and 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 the doors would be left open on the trains and people would grab the guns and the rocket launchers and all that and it would basically flood into the community i heard those stories i, I never witnessed i never witnessed that but did you do do you remember seeing like a super influx of guns and and, and things at some point like it's like yo you're getting money everybody's getting money and then all of a sudden things became very violent well you figure that that what happened is uh, young guys start to have millions of dollars uh, and and they wanted guns to protect themselves. They felt that uh, they were going to be people who were going to try to take their money and they wanted to have some type of protection for themselves. So they took the money that they made from selling drugs and they bought high power rifles and uh, special pistols, in, including myself. Um. And, and it also, too, kind of uh, it destabilized it while it was destabilizing a government in in South America, Central and South America, do you remember watching the community change also? Like seeing your community become like this violent, uh, unstable environment of drugs, guns, and gangs? Do you do you kind of like visually, like when you look back on that, do you remember seeing it that way? Well, well, our neighborhood was already pretty violent with gangs. Uh, gangs that started fighting each other before, before the crack came in, before cocaine, uh, we were already having gang violence. Uh, what I would say happened is that the gangs were able to get uh, more high power weapons and uh, it, it, it definitely increased the violence. Um, because there there are there has been a sentiment and, and I'd love to hear from you that people want to blame you uh, for crack. And what do you say to that? Well, uh, uh, my, I guess my judge said it best uh, uh, when I got sentenced in, in, in Cincinnati, Ohio. He told me, he said, I know the prosecutor and the police and everybody are blaming you for this. 
but I sentenced my first drug dealer when you were born. The same year you were born is the same year I sentenced my first drug dealer. So mm -hmm. drugs have been here before me. They'll be here after me. And uh, if people want to, you know, place the blame on me, I will accept it. But then you also have to place the blame on the guy that, that introduced me to drugs. Mm -hmm. And then you just um, keep going and keep going. And, and, and I mean, you could do that to infinity if you're just blaming people. I'm more looking for solutions instead of uh, uh, pointing fingers. Um, no, I appreciate that 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 perspective too. You've also, uh, I guess, in the past, took issue. You know, you, you brought up John Singleton and the issue with Snowfall, but you took issue with the rapper Rick Ross too. I think early on, and, yeah, and were vocal I, about I, that. Did you guys ever iron that out back no, in 2010? I, I think I sued him. I lost in court. Uh, the court said I should have filed my lawsuit uh, five days before I got out of prison. Uh, but you know, I, I've had a lot of stuff taken from me uh, since I've been home from prison. You know, uh, my documentary "Freeway Crack in the System" was also taken from me, uh, and I, I just feel that it's an intellectual ripoff. You know, people are, are, are ripping my story, but they're not taking any of the uh, 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 the blame or any of the, the responsibilities that I have to take. They're just taking all the upside, the glamorization of it. Exactly. And and I think that's the poignant piece of this podcast, right? You being able to have a voice here. Exactly. Um, after the snow, uh, freeway Rick Ross, Dave Mays is also on the podcast. Yeah, Dave Mays. Uh, he 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 came up with the idea, um, uh, and 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 he really does all of it because I I get a lot of offers to do podcasts and 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 different little things, and and I've been turning them down pretty much because of my schedule is. It's so busy, you know, uh, I'm juggling about five or six different businesses right now. And, and I really didn't need another one. But uh, Dave convinced me that that this was the right thing to do. And uh, I, I really love the idea. Now that I'm doing it, I'm enjoying uh, watching the show. Uh, and I, I'd had din dinner, with, I mean, lunch with Franklin before, too. Uh, one day I was at Whole Food downtown in L.A. And um, I was sitting at the table and this guy walks up to me. Uh, and I didn't know who he was because I never watched the show, and he had this British accent. And uh, uh, one of my one of my uh, managers said, "Oh, that's uh, Franklin from Snowfall," and uh, I invited him to sit down and have lunch with me, and we had a nice conversation. Do you now? Do you like the show, even though you feel slighted, um, and you feel as if there should have obviously been, you know, you should have been more woven into the upside of the show? Do you like the show? Well, I can, I can tell you why uh, they didn't invite me to the show because uh, they're, they're they're pushing violence too much. Most drug dealers don't want don't want violence in their game, and and I can tell you even when we went to the feds, uh, they had us labeled as as, as dangerous uh, individuals. But later on, after the feds had got used to having us in there, they declassified us from being violent uh, because most drug dealers know that when you get violent it brings another uh, uh level of law enforcement into the game ladies and gentlemen we have freeway rick ross on here a uh, new podcast after the snow um i think you know it does seem in snowfall there obviously and in a lot of drug uh documentaries movies whatever there is a hyper focus on the violence so it's 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 interesting to hear you frame it that way uh, for people who aren't in that game to understand that. Uh, but it does seem like the drugs bring violence, as we pointed out, because people are making a lot of money, so they get these, you know, they get weapons, they get, you know, things get aggressive because it's, uh, there's conflicts over territory, conflicts over who's controlling the game, correct? We we were anti-violent. Uh, some people even say that, that, that cocaine was the first peace treaty between the different gangs because for the first Everybody time... Everybody was getting money. Exactly. That was the first time I ever seen Crips and Blood standing on the same street hustling together. I, I totally hear what you're saying. It does feel like there have been intellectual ripoffs on, on you over the years. Um, what are you going to try to do in the years moving forward, you know, to have an opportunity to tell your story and get to financially benefit from some of these stories uh, like other people have? Well, you know, uh, uh, I've been working on my movie for about 30 years now. When I was in prison, I worked with uh, George Jackson. He helped me 
Uh, I have another late professor that was from UCLA that used to come and visit me that was helping me. So I've been working on my story for quite a while. I, I always knew that my story is going to rock is going to rock the country because of um, there's never been a story like mine, you know, where a guy made as much money as I did, had absolutely no violence. Uh, I've never had to kill anybody. I never had to uh, whoop anybody. Uh, uh, I, I mean, I could have made those decisions, but I always uh, uh, try to err on the other side of, of violence because I know violence will become violence. Uh, so when you have a story like that, here, here you got a guy that was totally illiterate, uh, had no father, was on welfare, um, and to to be able to 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 do the things that I've already done in life, uh, uh, people are going to think amazing. But the things that I'm doing right now. You know, when I went to prison, I was totally illiterate. I uh, taught myself how to read and write while I was there. Uh, I found the issue that got myself out of, out of prison. My lawyer went to Harvard University. My prosecutor went to Yale University. I had one, the top chief judge out of San Diego, and none of them saw the issue that I brought to their wow. attention, um, that the appeals court eventually agreed with what I said. Um, I read over 300 books while I was in prison, so I'm no longer illiterate. Uh, I, I'm very educated, uh, even though I don't have the, the degree to, to back it. Uh, I've spoken at some of the biggest colleges in the country. I spoke at Brown University, St. John, UCLA, USC. Um, and I, I'm still I still don't have a high school diploma. And these colleges paid me to come there and speak. So when you when you look at all of those things, you would be like this guy did a total 360 or maybe even more than the 360, you know, I might have turned around three or four times. We get the uh, the final draft from the, from the script doctor. Uh, we have $30 million in the bank uh, to shoot. Uh, I'm going to tonight. I got a meeting with uh, one of Elon Musk's partners who's a multi-billionaire. He's interested in coming on board, putting up money. Uh, so all we really need right now is P&A dollars. And uh, we should be going. I also got a meeting today with... Uh, another company who, who one of the guys produced on snowfall who are interested in doing another tv series it sounds like your story um is because i did not know that you were completely unable to read illiterate when you went to prison which means that you went through elementary school junior high school was in high school and still couldn't read so it sounds like your story is more about how our system our excuse me our society failed a young black man and he chose a path to get to money as quick as possible. Absolutely. And and it's also going to show a love story too. You know how my group of guys, we, we actually loved each other. You know, we were, we were brothers. Uh, we stuck together and, and we, we avoided the gang system. Mm. Which is very hard to do in Los Angeles. Absolutely. Cause I wanted to be a crip at about 11 years old. Uh, uh, I, I wanted to be a crip. Wow. Back to back to you being illiterate, um, and 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 the neighborhood you come from. Which neighborhood are you from? South Central, uh, seventy set. I mean, eighty uh, seventh figure Figueroa. Um, and and do you do you remember getting through school and not being able to read, or teachers just not caring? Like, what was that environment? Well, I, I had learned how to game the system. You know, when I was in high school, I knew that. Uh, go to the smartest person in the class and a certain test needed to be passed and I would copy off their, off their test. You know, what I found out about myself is that I'm a great copycat. If I see somebody else do it, I can copy it. And then not only can I copy it, but I can also make it a little better most of the time. So you was always a hustler. You figured out the hustle. Exactly. Um, and was that the same decision? Like when, when you think about that decision to sell cocaine and to continue to take it further do you remember your mind state at the time well when when, when my when my friend michael mclaurin first called me over to his house uh i just i just got out of jail from a, a grand theft auto case i had when when i was when i was 18 i had a, a a chop shop as soon as i got out of high school i started hanging out with the car thieves and uh, eventually uh, uh i got my own chop shop and my chop shop had just got raided uh i was looking at uh, 21 years in prison for, 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 for Grand Theft Auto and I, I didn't have a hustle so when Mike called me and he introduced me to cocaine for the first time 
um, I didn't believe what he was telling me. You know, he was telling me that something the size of a match head was worth 50 bucks. And I was like, you mean it ain't big as a car? You know, I, I couldn't hide a car, you know, when the police raided, but something the size of a match head, I could find a million places I could hide that. And uh, I said that he was telling me the truth. I was going to be rich. Wow. Oh, and all of this will be in the movie, I'm sure. So there's more. There's definitely more to the story because, you know, when you say you're working on a movie, it's kind of, you know, it strikes me and I go, well, I've heard this. I've heard this story already, but there's definitely more to the story. And it sounds like your framing is a perspective we have not seen yet. What's up, y'all? <laughs> I think we lose. Oh, they recognize you. Yeah, yeah, some young cats. I'm doing an interview right now. No, y'all good. Y'all good. You know, I had meetings with the four most powerful guys in Hollywood, and and, and I walked out on all of them. But why Ori, is that? Because the money wasn't right. Yeah, they, well, with Ori Manuel, he told me that I was going to have to listen to Mark Wahlberg, that I'll be taking orders from Mark Wahlberg. Something just like that almost. Like, I'm going to be taking orders, and I'm like, I don't take orders from nobody. When I walked out to prison, I wasn't taking no more orders. And uh, Michael Linton, I walked out on him because he was going to give uh, Nick Cassavetti two and a half million dollars and he only wanted to give me 800,000. And I couldn't see how Nick Cassavetti was more valuable to the to the story than I was. Uh, Jeff Bird, it was a similar situation. He offered us he offered me like six hundred fifty thousand. So. Uh, well, they, well, sir, we, we don't know any of these people that you're mentioning, uh, but <laughs> I'm glad you I'm glad you pushing for the bag you feel you deserve. You know what I mean? Go for it. It was better to do it independent anyway. You know, I did my book independent. I self-published uh, on my own publishing company and, uh, and and I'm doing great with it. You know, it's still selling right now today. Well, uh, sir, it, thank you for coming on the program. Everybody look for the podcast after the snow if you want to know more of this story and when you get the movie uh sorted we'd love to have you in the studio for a face to face we can do that we can do that tell them to check out my book too free with ricky ross untold autobiography also my new book 21 keys to success um and they're not just my life story they're also motivational books where you can learn uh some of my principles and some of my traits and don't get it from amazon go to my my website free ricky and get the book well, and, and we don't we don't want to and we don't want them to pick up the other traits, which is, you know, selling illegal narcotics and ending up behind bars. We're going to stay away from that part. But the the hustler part, the understanding the game part, the work ethic part, the positivity part and the stay away from violence part, I think are good traits. Well, you know, a teacher read my book and she said that it should be uh, pushed in every school around the country because it's an anti-gang book. Mm, hard. Yep. Well, thank Yo, you thank for that, you, man. All thank right. Shout out to Break today. Beats too. Uh, shout out to Break Beats and, and uh, Dave for uh, putting this together for me, man. Appreciate y'all. There it goes. Freeway Rick Ross. We'll see you on the next one. All right. Peace thank out. You, thanks, Take man. care.